All right, uh, it's Berkeley time, so we'll get started. Today's programming lecture is much shorter, so um, yeah, we'll probably get through it pretty quickly. But uh, today we'll be going over CSS animations. Um, but before that, let's get through some announcements. First one is homework six is released today, and uh, as always, due next Thursday. Lab five, uh, which was released this past Tuesday, will be due the following Tuesday, and homework five is due like now. Um, and of course, you guys have been working on your midterm project, and that will be due uh, the 17th, which is five days from now at midnight. Um, yes, quite a few deadlines. Okay, but just to jump into content. So um, with animations, uh, basically what this will allow us to do once we learn this is create websites that have a lot of motion and flow in it. Um, and as we can see here, uh, it's just like a lot more engaging, which of course will, uh, as we jump into the design, we'll talk about how this will um, improve our branding. I think just in general, animations will allow for a level of engage engagement with a user that otherwise can't be achieved with more like static websites. So that's kind of the reasoning behind this. Um, and just as a sort of context so far, what we have seen are CSS pseudo selectors, things that uh, like hover elements, um, and so that will already allow some sort of like movement in your website, but animations are a little different and we'll get into just how. So um, really quickly, the way we want to think of animations rather than this complicated like series of movement is really just a change of state. If you can decide or if you can determine what your initial and your final state is, that's like 90% of the work. The rest you can just fill in um, with some CSS attributes. But a big, uh, the big idea behind animations is figuring out what you want to start as, what you want it to end as. And yes, that this can be achieved purely in CSS. Um, so just to go over some syntax, right? Uh, we do have to include this like label at keyframes here. Um, and then just as always, we will have our name here. Maybe, uh, so, so the syntax here is a little different. Uh, we're not trying to grab an HTML element. We're not trying to grab um, a certain class or ID. Rather, we're defining something that lives just within the CSS file. And so this name here can be whatever you want. Um, typically, we want to abide by naming conventions such that uh, the name of your animation that we're defining here uh, is gives the user or gives yourself a pretty clear um, indication of what it's supposed to do. So let's say your animation, for example, you want to grab an element and you want it to slide up. Maybe you'll just name it up, you know what I mean, or slide up. Um, so that's just the name. And then within the rules, we'll kind of see what we can affect and what we can um, set with CSS. So this is just kind of a placeholder. And also with the at keyframes, uh, when, you're, when you write this up, uh, this alone won't do anything. Um, you have to apply this animation to a certain uh, HTML element that you can select um, in a different block. So um, really quick, just to define what this might look like. Um, our rules, there are two different methods. The first one we'll go over is using from and to. So just as I said earlier, if you can decide what your initial and final state are, um, your animation is like 90% done. In this case, we're following that principle here. From is your starting state and to is your ending state. So your animation will smoothly tra traverse from your starting state to your ending state. So in this case, fade in. Well, we're probably trying to fade in something, right? And so if we're starting with opacity zero, you shouldn't see your element. You end with opacity one, you should see your element. And then in between, it'll slowly, gradually fade in. And that's your animation. Um, we can do a similar thing now with percentages if we want to be a little more uh, granular. Um, before, we can only ident or like indicate your starting and ending. Maybe you want to be a little more specific in between. Maybe you want to add something. Um, so in this case, Percentages will refer to at what stage are you uh, from the animation or like in the animation. If you think of it as like a, a starting point and an ending point, 0% is kind of like you're from, 100% is like you're to, and anything in between is, well, anything in between. Uh, in this case, fade in out would start at opacity zero, and then as you move along halfway through, it should be opacity one, and then at the very end, it should be opacity zero again. So as you can imagine, this will gradually fade in, then gradually fade out. Um, that's kind of what we're defining here with our uh, percentages. And we don't just have to do this with opacity. You can pretty much do this with like any CSS attribute. 
Um, so in this case, top will refer to our top margin. Um, yes, so if we break this down a little bit, it might be a little confusing as to why we start here and then we end back here. So remember top margin, um, when we say top is like the space from the top. So we're gonna start 100 pixels pushed down. And then as we go to 50%, our top becomes zero pixels. Therefore there's no space, so it comes up. And then it gets pushed back down to 100 pixels. So that's kind of the idea there if we wanna like encode motion. Um, so those are just a few simple examples. Uh, of course, as we continue to like combine these and apply different uh, attributes to this, we can create something a lot more complex. So again, there's a lot of moving parts here. You don't have to worry too much about it. Um, instead, kind of observe our starting and ending state, identify the moving elements individually, and see how those can kind of come together with very simple uh, rules. And so let's see how this is applied. So again, as I mentioned earlier, defining an, defining an animation alone isn't enough to do anything. We have to assign it to a certain HTML element. Uh, so in this case, uh, we are grabbing the HTML element with the ID uh, potato head, okay? And to call this animation, to basically reference and say, hey, I want to use a certain animation on this element, um, you will use animation name to tell the CSS to look for that name. Um, that you have defined. In this case, we're going to reference up down, which we saw earlier uh, using the percentages. And we're going to use, let's see, animation duration 0.5 seconds. So, okay, I'm going to really quickly point out this is not actually what up down should do. Uh, it shouldn't like stick here and then pause. It's kind of just like the delay of the an animation on the slides. So, don't worry about that for now. Um, but, sorry, going back, the animation duration will just indicate how long you want this animation to run for. We've, de de we've uh, determined the initial and ending state, but we also have to say like, how long do you want to get from point A to point B? Um, so in this case, it'll take 0.5 seconds. Um, yeah. Okay, so there are more properties that apply to animations, but the mandatory ones, the bare minimum is defining the animation name and the duration. Without that, the computer will have like no idea what you want to see. Uh, the rest is kind of like optional to kind of uh, tweak and adjust as as you like. But at the very at the bare minimum, if you're not seeing any movement, double check that you have the name and duration set. Okay, so looking at our optional adjustments here, uh, there are four main ones. I think there's like a little more, but the four main ones that you'll most likely use to improve your functionality is um, first one is a speed curve, and so. Uh, previously, what we saw is just constant speed from A to B, right? Um, if, let's say, you want to animate something falling, right, uh, we would probably have to use something that starts slow and then gradually gets faster to simulate maybe, like, acceleration. Um, so speed curves are really helpful because uh, there are a bunch of native different speed curves that define, like, how fast it goes and how it slows down over time so that you can best uh, emulate the behavior that you're looking for. Um, and, of course, that is with the attribute animation timing function. And just to like skip ahead a little, this is what some of the speed curves look like. Um, and so there's, there's a lot, right? But really, I mean, in practice, you'll probably only use a few. Uh, but for example, that gravity example, um, let's say we're trying to drop an item. We want to start slow and then speed up. Maybe, I don't know, like ease, ease out court. There, there's like with simpler ones, like the ease in is, the ease in that we saw earlier will we'll do just that, right? But if you want to get more specific for, I don't know, whatever purposes, you can use this as a reference. And then delay, let's say, so one thing I forgot to mention is with pseudo selectors that we learned previously, things like hover, um, that will require some sort of interaction with the user, right? They'll actually have to drag their mouse over to activate what you wanted to see. Um, with animations, however, they just kind of run on their own. So let's say you have an animation set, um, but you don't want it to start right away upon loading the web page. You can set an animation delay, uh, maybe let's say two seconds, so that after the web page loads, it waits two seconds and then activates your animation. That can be useful just to like, so you don't the user doesn't miss what is what is shown. But yeah, basically this is just to um, delay the start of the animation. And then play number, otherwise known as iteration count is the number of times you want the animation to run. By default, it is one. So if I wanted something to bounce like back and forth over and over, and I didn't set our iteration count, 
it would just bounce, maybe bounce down and up, and then it would just pause, you know? So having an iteration count will allow you to define how many times you want something to run. If you want it to run infinitely, you can just say infinite. It doesn't have to be an integer value. And direction. Uh, this one is kind of interesting. Uh, reverse will just play the animation in reverse. Um, there are a few other ones that you can just look up. If you look up animation direction, CSS, it'll, it'll give you a list of different things and, and demo like what they do. Um, one we'll see in the future demo is, uh, I forget, alternate, which causes it to go from its starting to final state and then back to its starting state. So that, that one could be useful for things that need to repeat back and forth. Okay. Um, and yeah, so I think like we've seen with other attributes like margin, background, like font, I think, or text, um, you can also just shorten this into one line, uh, but it does follow a convention. It does follow an ordering so that if you do decide to put it in one line, make sure that all your attributes are in the correct order. Uh, for clarity, though, you can always just keep it separate like this. Um, it, functionally, it's, it's the same. Okay. Uh, and lastly, this is kind of a special property. Uh, you might not use as much, but fill mode will essentially tell uh, CSS like where you want it to stop. If you do want it to stop in a state that isn't the final state, you might want to specify with this. Okay, and just again, as a, as a review, um, as a distinction between our pseudo selectors and keyframes, um, pseudo selectors, they respond to user's action, whereas animations just kind of continuously and automatically happen on their own. Um, and yeah, the diff other differences are here in, in terms of syntax and, and use. Otherwise though, kind of similar. Uh, before I move into the demo though, do you have any questions? Okay, maybe we'll have, oh, yes. Yeah, so uh, for that case, we'd probably have to, uh, David, correct me if I'm wrong, but we'd probably have to use JavaScript so that upon scrolling to a desired location, JavaScript could then modify the, the CSS such that it activates the animation, so it could trigger it in that sense. Is there a simpler way to, yeah, I, I don't think CSS has like a way of detecting scroll on its own. Um, but yes, good question. And for now, if you wanted to like simulate that and just let's say you expect your user to like scroll down there in like three seconds, you could just delay it by three seconds. But there is a more sophisticated way which we'll cover um, in future lectures. Uh, good question though, any other questions? Okay, in that case, I will go through the demo and we'll see some of these in practice. So let's see how do I do this. Oh, oh geez. Okay, so here we have, oh, let me, let me quit this out really quick. All right, so a very simple, simple example here. We have two basic HTML elements. We have our pumpkin and we have our shadow. Um, we're not gonna really touch this HTML at all, so I'm just gonna click out of it. Yeah, so we're really only worried about our CSS here. So let's take a look. Um, sorry, it's like really hard for me to see. But so we have our pumpkin here with, you know, whatever styling we want to do. Um, maybe, you know, like our sizing or with that, that stuff. And we also have our animation. So if we take a look, what animation are we referring to here? If we recall in our shorthand notation, the first thing that we specify is the name. So let's go ahead, let's try to find the name. It's right here, very convenient. Let's see. So in bounce, we're defining our from and to state. Again, our starting and our ending position. Uh, we're starting with, let's see, transform y, or sorry, translate y down 200 pixels. And at the end, it translates up to 30 pixels. So 
I mean, bounce is essentially just causing it to shift along the y axis. And if we return back to this animation here, uh, at the very end, our that was called, but it's it's alternate. So it's going to go back and forth from its starting and ending position. It'll go a to b, b to a, a to b, and so on and so forth. And because we've set infinite, this will just bounce endlessly. Um, again, the other thing to notice here, as I kind of alluded to earlier, uh, it's not a constant speed, right? So uh, if it were a constant speed, it would look a lot less realistic. Uh, pumpkins bouncing is probably not that realistic, but uh, the fact that it kind of emulates gravity here is a result of using this ease in function. And of course, uh, this is happening over 0.5 seconds. If we look at the shadow, we'll find something very similar. Um, again, all the CSS just for like default behavior. Um, and again, the animation. So in this case, we are referencing shadow size. Uh, this time, we're not translating it up and down. We want it to grow in size and kind of just stay in the same position. So to do that, we can use scale, which references like what proportion of its original size are we going to going to use. Um, so because at 0%, otherwise like from, uh, we start at one, it's going to start at its original size. Uh, and then as it goes to 100%, the end of our animation, it's going to drop to zero to basically non-existent, right? And of course, as we can see, we are matching our alternate so that it does exactly as the pumpkin is doing. It's going back and forth from its initial and final states uh, endlessly, right? Um, of course, because there we want it to be in sync, we'll probably have to use a lot of similar um, like attributes. So like 0.5 seconds, if we were to have like 0.6, it would fall out of sync and it would go a little slower, as we can see here. So we don't want that. And our ease in, of course, oh, let me refresh that. Yeah, sometimes this site does funny things. Okay, so we're back here. Um, and that's pretty much everything I want to say. Uh, if we do want to see experiment with anything, feel free to suggest it now. Yes. Okay, that behavior is actually pretty complicated because what that would indicate is it would change the bound. Ooh, okay, it's actually doable. I, I have like one way of doing it, and that would be you define like percentages such that maybe it takes like from zero to 20 and then 20 to 35, it goes up and down, and then in smaller increments. Sorry, I think I, I flipped that, but from like even time intervals the y gets smaller and smaller. So that's one way to do that. That's a really like brute force solution and it'll take a lot of like tedious guess and check. Um, I don't know, is there a way to do it in JavaScript so that you alter the contents of the function? There might be, but it's like a lot more complicated than it might seem. Yes, but there is a way, there definitely is a way. So can you make it Um, oh, I don't think I've ever tried that. I think you can only reference one animation. Uh, again, this is something that I, I just like default to JavaScript. Let's say you want to activate one animation after the other, because you can only specify one animation named here, you could change the text of the, or you could change um, the contents of this attribute using JavaScript later. Sorry, I keep saying JavaScript, but Eventually, you'll have a way to like change it, so you can link. Uh, yeah, there is a way. There is a way. Yeah. Any other questions or like things you might want to see? There's like one thing I'm holding back right now. Okay. No other questions. I just want to. I just want to see this because I, I have done this in previous semesters. But since this right here specifies the time it takes for the animation to complete, if we were to cut this decimal out. Notice our pumpkin falls into slow motion, right? If we were to actually count the seconds, it takes five whole seconds for it to go from one state to the other, right? Don't worry about this being out of sync. We're only editing the pumpkin, right? But then, of course, the opposite is true. So if we were to add a zero here, right, our pumpkin just like, yeah, you know, it's not as funny as the second time. But yeah, that's pretty much it. So play around uh, with your timing. Uh, when you're trying to figure out like just exactly what the motion you're looking for, um, how if that's expressed properly through your CSS.
Um, yeah, that's pretty much it for animations. Uh, let me close this out. And we will move on to, oh, sorry, last minute questions before I, before I pass it off. Yeah. Things that spin, yeah. So there is another attribute. Uh, I think it's like, mm, is it rotate? I'm forgetting, but there's that, that one's a pretty simple attribute to use to then go from like zero to like 180 to, or you can like, oh, I think it's like translate. It's gotta be like an angle thing that you just set. Yeah, that's also very achievable with animations. Yeah, is rotate. Okay, cool. Um, if no other questions, I will go ahead and pass it off to, who am I passing off to? To Kylie for design.